Well, good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Community Bible Church. We're so glad that you've decided to worship with us online today. Um, today we're going to be in the book of Acts. Uh, for a number of weeks as a church, we've been studying the book of Acts. And over the last few weeks, we got a little bit detoured by this whole coronavirus thing. Um, but we're going to jump back into the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4 is where we'll be. And so if you have a Bible at home, this would be a good time to grab that so you can follow along. And we'll be in Acts chapter 4. You know, we live in a world and, and really a country that is becoming increasingly hostile to the Christian faith. And we certainly don't face anything near the degree of persecution that many of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are experiencing. But nevertheless, here in America, we as Christians are facing growing opposition. And there are a number of, I think, troubling incidents that I think point to uh, the possibility and maybe even the probability that we will face growing opposition and persecution in the days ahead. Let me highlight some examples for you. Let me read an article here. Baron L. Stutzman is a floral design artist who loves and serves everyone at her small shop in Richland, Washington. For nearly 10 years, she developed a lasting friendship with Robert Ingersoll and created dozens of innovative floral arrangements celebrating major events in his life, including Valentine's Day and anniversary gifts for his partner, Kurt Fried. But when the couple decided to marry, Baron L. was faced with a difficult choice betray her religious convictions, or disappoint a friend. Baronel took her friend Robert aside, told him how much she loved him, and explained that she could not create custom arrangements for or participate in the wedding ceremony. She referred him to three floral design studios nearby. They parted on good terms, and that would have been the end of the matter. But Washington State's Attorney General filed a one-of-a-kind lawsuit bringing a consumer protection complaint instead of leaving the matter to the Washington Human Rights Commission and waiting for someone to file a complaint as is usually done. The Attorney General has also threatened not only Baronell's business, but in a highly unusual move has joined the ACLU in suing her personally as well. The Attorney General admits that Baronell creates expression for a living, but he argues that the state can force her to create certain messages or even require poets to write poems consistent with the government's view on marriage. Baronell has spent nearly seven years in litigation and as the object of public derision and death threats, all because she couldn't speak a message or participate in a wedding ceremony that her faith disbelieves. Now, um, as you read this story and as you study the circumstances and you hear this dear lady interviewed, it's very clear that this is not some hateful, homophobic bigot who, who refuses to gay, serve gay people. No, she has a long history of, of not only serving gay customers, but employing gay employees and doing so quite happily. Um, she was a good friend of, of this very man. And some might say, well, maybe she could have found a more creative way to, to honor her convictions and honor this customer's request. And, and that may be, right? I think those are questions that as Christians, we're going to have to increasingly explore in the days ahead. But my point in sharing this story is this. The cultural ground beneath us has shifted over the last couple of decades, right? Um, this kind of thing wouldn't have happened even, even 20 years ago. But we now find ourselves living in a world where the culture around us is not content merely that we as Christians not condemn sinful behaviors, nor are they even content if, if we were to simply condone their sinful behaviors. No, today we live in a world where the culture around us will not be satisfied until we as Christians actively celebrate sinful behaviors. And, and endorse them and even facilitate them. And of course, that's something that we as God's people can't do, which means that increasingly we'll face pressure and persecution. And that's not just true of Christian individuals it's, or Christian business owners. It's, it's increasingly true of churches as well. Um, a number of churches which are, are now trying to rent space in, in public school facilities are increasingly be, being told no, even though those same public schools are more than happy to rent space on weekends to Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and basketball leagues. Um, a number of churches that are trying to buy property in, in the very community where their church members live and pay taxes are increasingly being told no. They're being prohibited from buying land even though they have the money to pay for it. Um, this is what we're up against. Um, in the most recent uh, presidential primary in the Democratic Party, a prominent Democratic candidate was advocating a policy that would basically strip the tax-exempt status away from churches and religious organizations and nonprofits who refuse to endorse gay marriage, right? And what would the practical implications of, of a policy like that be? Well, um, some say, well, that would just mean that when you give to your church, you wouldn't get a tax break, right? No big deal. We shouldn't be giving for that purpose anyway. Well, true enough, but, but it actually means more than that. It probably means that churches like ours, nonprofit churches, would be required to pay property taxes at the same rate as for-profit businesses that have much higher income streams. 
And that would be a crippling financial burden for many churches. In effect, practically speaking, many churches would be taxed right off their own property, essentially forcing them to close their doors. And sadly, many people were celebrating the idea of this policy. Uh, my point is this. Increasingly, we're seeing examples around us of, of Christian voices being silenced, of, of Christians and churches being forced out of the public square, being forced out of public spaces, and possibly even being forced off of their own property. Now, if that were to happen, where would we find ourselves? Well, we would find ourselves in a situation not unlike persecuted Christians around the world today. And interestingly enough, we would find ourselves in a situation very much like the one we find ourselves in today. A situation where we're not able to gather together in large groups. A situation where we're not able to enjoy a church building for worship, where we're forced to find alternative creative ways to, to worship and to gather and to stay connected. We would find ourselves in a situation where outreach events in a church campus would be impossible, where we would have to focus more on individual relational outreach in neighborhoods. And while these would be difficult changes, many of them would be healthy changes. Um, you know, some people have speculated that, that this COVID-19 pandemic may actually be a good thing. It may be a blessing from God in that it may well be that God's preparing for us for a greater pandemic that may be coming, Right. As pandemics go in human history, this one's relatively mild. There are certainly worse ones that have happened, and some say inevitably will happen, and some would say that, that uh, this is a wake-up call to, to get us ready for the next big one, right? They would say that this may well be God's gracious purpose for this in, in humanity at this time, and that may well be. But what if God has a more specific purpose in this COVID-19 pandemic for the church? What if God is preparing us, not just for the coming pandemic, but for the coming persecution? What if God has allowed this current crisis to enable us to become more nimble, less facilities dependent, more relational and neighborhood focused in our outreach, the kind of outreach that would be necessary if we found ourselves facing persecution? Now, I don't claim to be a prophet. I don't know what the future holds. But at the very least, this weird season that we're in provides an interesting thought experiment sort of a, a real-life laboratory for us to say, hey, how would we fare as a church if we did find ourselves under the gun of persecution, if our faith came under fire? It's an interesting opportunity for us to think about not just how we would adjust um, from a logistics standpoint and a technology standpoint, but, but in an even deeper sense, what principles would we as a church need to embrace if we suddenly found ourselves in an extended season of, of persecution? Well, the passage of Scripture before us, I think, is very helpful in this regard because it records for us the first example of persecution in the early church following the death and resurrection of Jesus. And as we look at this passage and we see how the apostles in the early church responded to persecution, I think we can learn from them and prepare ourselves to respond well when our faith comes under fire. I think in this passage we see five main principles that we need to embrace, that we need to keep in mind when we find ourselves facing opposition and when our faith is under fire as God's people. And the first of these principles is the principle of compassion. Now let me just provide some context before we jump here into chapter 4. Um, if you're with us in our last study, we saw in Acts chapter 3 that Peter and John were uh, going to the temple to pray. And as they were entering the temple, they noticed on the, the side of the road there a, a lame man, a man who was crippled. He was begging for alms. And, and, and while this man was largely invisible to most of the crowd there that day, um, most people just sort of passed by him. Peter and John stopped. They noticed him and, and, and they said to him, listen, we, we can't give you money, but we'll give you what we do have. Peter held out his hand. He said, take my hand, get up and walk. And, and immediately that man was healed. Immediately he began jumping up and down and praising God. And of course, that drew the attention of the crowds. All eyes were on them. And Peter used this as an opportunity to glorify Jesus and to share the gospel with the crowds. Well, that brings us to where we are here in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 verse 1 says this, As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, one of the religious groups that's mentioned here is the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, part of their doctrine was they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believe that when human beings die, they go to the grave and there's no afterlife, there's no heaven, there's no hell, that's just the end of it. And that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> uh, sorry, that's the obligatory joke that everybody has to share when they talk about the Sadducees. But the Sadducees, bottom line, didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they're upset that, that these disciples of Jesus are proclaiming that he's raised from the dead. Verse 3, 
And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered and together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of, of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a, a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. So Peter and John find themselves uh, being cross-examined by these high-powered religious officials in the temple there. And Peter in essence says, listen guys, if we've been hauled before this court because we helped this man, because we transformed his life and we healed him and made him a better person, then, then guilty as charged, right? Um, and what's interesting is, is that they threw him in jail for this. And, and after being jailed, 5,000 people gave their lives to Jesus. Imagine that. Now, you'd think that would have the opposite effect, right? You'd think these people would say, hey, listen, if following Jesus gets you thrown in jail, then I'm going to stay away. But the people could not stay away. They were compelled to join Jesus. Why? Because they saw the life-changing power of Jesus demonstrated through, through the compassion of his disciples. They saw that when everybody else walked by this crippled man, the disciples alone stopped to help. They saw that when everybody else treated this man like, like an annoyance, right, like an inconvenience, these, these disciples treated him like, like a human being made in the image of God. They saw that when everybody else merely threw him a little bit of pocket change, only the disciples offered him genuine life change. They saw the power and compassion of Jesus through his disciples, and they were drawn to it. Now, we might be tempted to say, well, well yeah, but Peter and the apostles, they, they could do miracles, right? They healed this guy for crying out loud. We can't do that, and, and that's true. But we can demonstrate the love and compassion of Jesus, can we not? And the early church was especially good at this, right? That's, that's partly why people were drawn to the faith in such large numbers, because the church exhibited such charity and compassion. I've shared these examples before, but in the first century Roman Empire, when, when Roman mothers would give birth to babies that they didn't want, they wouldn't abort them in the womb. They would just give birth to them and then throw them out on the street to die of exposure. And recognizing this, the, the Christians put together a ministry where they would form baby runs. They'd go up and down the streets of Rome looking for these abandoned babies and they would take them into their homes and adopt them and raise them as their own. And the world noticed that. Um, in the first century Roman Empire, or, or the early Roman Empire, um, there were many pandemics, many plagues that swept through the Roman Empire, far more devastating than COVID-19. And, and, and when that happened, many times entire cities or villages would be devastated by these plagues and people would run for their lives from these cities, sometimes leaving behind loved ones to, to die and to struggle and, su and suffer on their own. And when everybody else was running from these cities, it was the Christians alone that were running into these cities to care for the suffering and the dying, many times at great cost to themselves, giving their own lives in the process. And people noticed this. They noticed there was something different about these Christ followers, the compassion, the charity. And, and as a result, um, many people came to faith in Jesus. And if we as God's people today can learn to exhibit that same kind of Christ-like compassion, like the early church, we will open up opportunities for the gospel that will be more powerful than any opposition to the gospel that we may face. Just as Jesus said, when, when we let our light shine, people will see our good works and give glory to our Father who's in heaven. I like the story that Doug Nichols shares. He says, while serving with Operation Mobilization in India in 1967, tuberculosis forced me into a sanitarium for several months. I did not yet speak the language, but I tried to give Christian literature in their language to the patients, doctors, and nurses. Everyone politely refused. I sensed many weren't happy about a rich American, to them all Americans were rich, being in a free government-run sanitarium. They didn't know I was just as broke as they were. The first few nights I woke around 2 a.m. coughing. One morning during my coughing spell, I noticed one of the older and sicker patients across the aisle trying to get out of bed. He would sit up on the edge of bed and try to stand, but in weakness would fall back into bed. I didn't understand what he was trying to do. He finally fell back into bed exhausted, I heard him crying softly. The next morning, I realized that the man had been trying to get up and walk to the bathroom. The stench in the ward was awful. Other patients yelled insults at the man, 
Angry nurses moved him roughly from side to side as they cleaned up the mess. One nurse even slapped him. The old man curled into a ball and wept. The next night, I again woke up coughing. I noticed the man across the aisle sit up and again try to stand. Like the night before, he fell back whimpering. I don't like bad smells, and I didn't want to become involved, but I got up out of bed and went over to him. When I touched his shoulder, his eyes opened wide with fear. I smiled, put my arms under him, and picked him up. He was very light due to old age and advanced tuberculosis. I carried him to the washroom, which was just a small, filthy room with a hole in the floor. I stood behind him with my arms under his armpits as he took care of himself. After he finished, I picked him up and carried him back to his bed. As I laid him down, he kissed me on the cheek, smiled, and said something I couldn't understand. The next morning, another patient woke and handed me a steaming cup of tea. He motioned with his hands that he wanted a tract. As the sun rose, other patients approached and indicated that they also wanted the booklets I had tried to distribute before. Throughout the day, nurses, interns, and doctors also asked for literature. Weeks later, an evangelist who spoke the language visited me. And as he talked to others in the sanitarium, he discovered that several had put their trust in Christ as Savior as a result of re reading the literature. Then he says this, What did it take to reach these people with the gospel? It wasn't health, the ability to speak their language, or a persuasive talk. I simply took a trip to the bathroom. You know, when we find ourselves in hostile territory, when we find ourselves in the minority as, as Christians, facing opposition, facing resistance, many times it will not be the eloquence of our words, but the simplicity of our deeds that will soften hard hearts. It will be our compassion that, that breaks through the opposition and draws people to Christ, especially in times when our faith is under fire. If we would respond well when our faith is under fire, we must first of all embrace the principle of compassion, but secondly, the principle of, of clarity. I want to put a uh, sentence on screen here, and I'd like you to read this sentence, and then I have a question for you. Do you believe this sentence? Now, you're not actually at church, so feel free to answer out loud if you like. Do you believe this sentence? And now, you may be scratching your head saying, well, it, it's hard to say, because in its current form, both a Christian and an atheist could affirm this sentence. It all depends on where you put the spaces. Read one way, it could say, God is nowhere which is exactly what an atheist would affirm. But read another way, it could say, God is now here, which is exactly what a Christian would affirm. It all depends on the distinctions. Now, I undertook this little exercise to demonstrate that when we're talking to other people about God, it is absolutely essential that we be crystal clear. The distinctions are important. Because it is possible to talk to people about God in a way that, that leaves the impression that we're all saying the same thing about him when... In fact, we may be saying very different things. And in this case, the differences make all the difference, right? In fact, it may mean the difference between heaven or hell for some people. And when our faith is under fire, when we're facing opposition or persecution, when we're put on the spot, it will always be tempting to remain just a little bit vague about our beliefs, to downplay those biblical truths that our culture might find offensive, to, to minimize the differences so as to minimize the conflict. And no doubt that's exactly what the temptation that Peter was facing here. Remember who he's standing in front of. He's standing in front of these religious leaders, among whom are men like Annas and Caiaphas, and if those names sound familiar to, to you, they, they should, right? Because these are the very same men who tried Jesus, who ultimately sent him to the cross. And, and now these very same men hold Peter's fate in their hands. And they asked him, by what power or in what name did you heal this man? Now, Peter needs to choose his words very carefully here or he's going to end up hanging on a cross like Jesus. Peter is under tremendous pressure here to, to say something perhaps a little ambiguous, uh, something that won't get him killed. Peter perhaps could have said something like, uh, well, we did this in the power of God, which technically would have been true, but wasn't really the full truth. It would have been very tempting for Peter to sort of fudge the truth. And remember, Peter didn't typically do well when, when he's under pressure, when he's facing opposition. Just not that long ago, he had denied Christ when he was under pressure like this. And, and he's facing the very same temptation here. Well, gratefully, Peter resisted the temptation. And notice what he said in, in verse 10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead... By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He, Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. 
And Peter here is quoting from Psalm 118, um, a passage that these men would have been very familiar with, a passage that pointed forward to the Messiah. Reading on in verse 12, Peter said, There is salvation in no one else, that is, no one other than Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Here Peter responds with crystal clarity. By whose power did we do these things, you ask? It was Jesus. And, and yes, he's alive from the dead. There is such a thing as resurrection, my friends, you Sadducees, right? And I love that Peter not only answered their question, but he wrapped his answer to the question in gospel truth both the good news and the bad news of the gospel. And that's important because many times, again, when we share the gospel, it's going to be our temptation to sort of minimize the bad news of the gospel. And what's the bad news? Well, it's the fact that we're all sinners deserving of God's judgment. Um, Peter didn't skip over that. He, he, he explicitly said, listen, this Jesus, this promised Messiah, you crucified him, right? You put to death God in human flesh. You, you're worthy of God's judgment, So he shared the bad news, but he very quickly moved to the good news. He gave them hope, and the good news of the gospel is what? That we can be saved through faith in Christ. And Peter made this point explicitly in verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And if verse 12 seems a little bit exclusive, you know, hey, what do you mean Jesus is the only way? How can you say that there's no one else by which we can be saved? Well, um, yes, this is an exclusive verse, but it's a very hope-filled verse. I think what Peter is saying to to the religious leaders and really to us is, is this one that you've been looking for and longing for your whole life, the Messiah, right? The one who will meet your needs and provide salvation, he's here, right? You don't have to look anywhere else. You won't find it anywhere else. It's in Jesus and only in Jesus. And guess what? He's here. Your spiritual search has come to an end if you'll let it. There's tremendous hope in Peter's words here. And when we're challenged about our faith, um, we should follow Peter's example here. We should answer the question, but, but wrap the answer to that question in gospel truth. Now, today we probably won't be challenged about our belief in the resurrection of Jesus. But we will be challenged about our belief in the teachings of Jesus. Specifically, his teachings on the subject of human sexuality. I mean, that's the flashpoint in our culture today. And there will be times when people will challenge us as Christians and they'll say, listen, you you Christians, um, who who are you to say that there are only two sexes, right? Who are you to say that a a boy can't be a girl or a girl can't be a boy if that's what they want? Who are you to say that that, that two men couldn't, for instance, get married? Who are you to tell people who they can love and who they can't? And, And when the question's framed like that, right? Well, none of us want to be regarded as unloving. And so the temptation, again, is going to be to backpedal a little bit to to minimize sin, to minimize the biblical standard, and in so doing, really um, fail to point people to their ultimate solution in Jesus. And we can't do that. We have to affirm the biblical standard. We have to affirm Jesus' teaching. And and by the way, what did Jesus teach on this subject? Well, very briefly, in Matthew 19, 4, Jesus said, "'Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female?' Jesus taught that that, that our sex, our gender, is, is not merely a social construct. It's not something that's fluid, something that we choose. No, it's, it's fixed in biological realities given to us at birth. Our, our gender, our sex, is a gift from God. He makes us, he creates us, either male or female. And, and, and men and women are, are equal in the eyes of God, but they're beautifully different, right? And they contribute unique things to, to society and to our lives, and, and it is our responsibility as his creatures to embrace our God-given sex, our God-given genders, and to live that out for the glory of God. That's the teaching of Jesus. He goes on in verse 5 to talk about how we should understand marriage. He said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Again, Jesus' teaching on marriage flies in the face of much of what our culture believes and teaches on this subject. Many in our culture believe that marriage is sort of a a temporary arrangement. You try it out, see how it goes. Uh, Not so with Jesus. Jesus said it's a lifelong commitment. It's a permanent relationship. There are many in our culture that would say that, that marriage can be between two people of the same sex, and Jesus says no. Marriage is a lifelong covenant relationship between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife. And there's a reason God designed it the way he did. Because men and women are are not interchangeable. They're not redundant. They're they're, they're beautifully different and unique. And and a husband and a wife, for for instance, um, contribute something unique and beautiful to that marriage relationship. A mother and a father contribute something unique and special 
uh, to the lives of their children and to their families. And you see, this is why God designed it the way he did. Because it's, it's really for our personal good, for the good of our marriages, for the good of our families, ultimately for the good of society. He created it this way and designed it such, both marriage and sexuality, in a way that, that maximizes human flourishing. And whenever we step outside of God's design for, for marriage or for sexuality, we do so ultimately to our own detriment. You see, there's a reason God established moral boundaries for us. And, and there's a reason we shouldn't cross those boundaries. When, when, when God says don't, what he really means is, is don't hurt yourself. And whenever we step outside of God's moral boundaries, whenever we, for instance, pursue sexual intimacy outside of that husband-wife permanent relationship through, through adultery or, or pornography or, or fornication or immorality of any kind, whether it be homosexual or heterosexual, whenever we step across those moral boundaries, not only are we sinning against God, but we're ultimately hurting ourselves and those around us. And that's why God has established these moral boundaries. And, and, and you know, in, in reality, we all do this. Whether in the sexual realm or other realms, we all transgress God's moral boundaries. We all disregard his laws for us. We are all sinners. This isn't a, a homosexual thing or a heterosexual thing. It's a human thing. We are all sinners in need of God's grace. And gratefully, that's where the gospel comes in. God, through Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross and through his resurrection, has provided forgiveness and hope and, and restoration and salvation. And, and you see, this is why we need to be crystal clear. Even in the face of opposition, we need to be certain that we are answering our culture's questions, but we're, we're, we're wrapping those answers in, in gospel truth and pointing people to the hope that can only be found in Jesus. When our faith is under fire, we need to respond with compassion, with clarity, and thirdly, with confidence. Notice Acts 4.13 with me. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. As these religious leaders saw the authority and the confidence and the boldness with which Peter and John spoke, they were puzzled. I mean, after all, these weren't seminary-trained rabbis like themselves. These were mere common fishermen, normal people, right? Where did they find such confidence and boldness? But then they remembered that they'd been with Jesus. And it's almost as though they were channeling the very spirit of Jesus, which is exactly what they were doing, right? You may recall that before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave to his disciples and to us today his great commission. And he said, listen, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And now, in effect, he said, I'm, I'm giving that to you. I want you to go out into the world with my authority and, and, and preach the gospel, right? Um, make disciples. And he said, remember, as you do that, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, he said, I'm with you always, not physically. He was about to ascend into heaven physically, but, but he said, I'm with you spiritually. My, my spirit will literally indwell you and empower you and authorize you to, to go about this business of making disciples for me. And, and it was this reality that gave Peter and John such boldness, such confidence and it's this same reality that will give us boldness as we go about sharing the gospel in a, in a world that is increasingly hostile to the Christian faith. We too have the very spirit of the risen Christ within us, and that should generate within us a spirit of confidence. Verse 14 goes on. It says, seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But, so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard." I mean, I just love their confidence. I love their boldness. They've been commanded by these very powerful religious leaders to, to stop evangelizing, to stop talking to people about Jesus. And, and these religious leaders, again, had tremendous power. They had the ability to send these men to their deaths. And yet, in response, what do Peter and John say? Whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. Hmm, who should we listen to, right? On the one hand, we have you guys. You're, you're a fine-looking bunch of men, right? Very impressive in your nicely pressed robes. Um, but at the end of the day, you're just mere men like we are. Should we listen to you or should we listen to God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who sent his son to die for us and to save us and to forgive us and to give us new life, right? I mean, on the one hand, you guys have the ability to, to kill us. We understand that, but, but Jesus can just raise us from the dead. We'll spend eternity with him forever. So 
All in all, I think we're going to go with him. I'm a, we're going to listen to God on this one. And, and, and no, we're not going to listen to you. We're going to continue to share the good news of Jesus. Um, the, the confidence, the boldness, and that derived from the fact that they understood um, that, that they're not obligated to anybody but Jesus Christ as their master, right? Um, they are not obligated to serve the culture or, or any human being. Their, their, their primary and ultimate obligation is to God. And, and you think about it, what is it that will enable us to exhibit that kind of confidence, that kind of courage in the face of opposition? What is it as Christians that will enable us to say no to very powerful people who can do real harm to us? It's knowing that we serve someone who is even more powerful than they are. John Kenneth Galbraith was a noted economist from many years back. Um, he was oftentimes consulted by presidents of the United States because of his economic knowledge. And in his autobiography, he shares this story. He says, it had been a wearying day, and I asked Emily, the family housekeeper, to hold all the telephone calls while I had a nap. Shortly thereafter, the phone rang. Lyndon Johnson, President of the United States, was calling from the White House. Get me Ken Galbraith. This is Lyndon Johnson, he said. He's sleeping, Mr. President. He said not to disturb him. Well, wake him up. I want to talk to him. No, Mr. President, I work for him, not you. <laughs> Galbraith says, when I called the president back, he could scarcely control his pleasure. Tell that woman I want her here in the White House, he said. Um, you know, that woman was, was able to say no to the very powerful president of the United States because she understood who her true boss really was. She understood who it was she had been called to serve. And I think it's important that we as Christians understand that as well. What is it that will give us the courage to go forth boldly, to share the gospel, even in the face of persecution, opposition, pressure? It's understanding that we don't serve the culture. We, we don't serve the people around us. Our only and our only primary obligation is to, to Jesus Christ himself. He is our one and only master. And that reality will give us the boldness that we need. Uh, verses 21 and following record how that these religious leaders let John and Peter go. Um, they went back and reported this whole thing to the church, shared all that had happened. They had a great little worship service there, praising and worshiping God, praying together. And verse 31 says, When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. May we as God's people speak with that kind of boldness as we recognize that we've been authorized by Jesus and filled with his Spirit to carry out that task. Well, if we're going to uh, respond with, when our faith is under fire, um, we have to respond with, with compassion uh, with clarity, with confidence, and finally, with community. Uh, many of these early believers that gave their lives to Jesus Christ were, were Jewish believers. And when their Jewish family members learned of what they had done, um, many times these Jewish Christians were, were disowned, they were disinherited, um, they lost their jobs, their livelihood, their property. Uh, they suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. And, and how did they make it? How did they move forward? How did the church respond to those needs? Well, that's recorded for us in verse 32. The congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with a great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. You see, as these believers began to suffer persecution at the hand of their family members, as they began to make tremendous sacrifices and experience loss as a result of their faith in Christ, um, how were those needs met? It was as a result of the, the community of believers who saw each other as family, spiritual family, brothers and sisters in Christ, so that those who had needs... Those needs were met by those who had a surplus. People that had property and lands would actually sell their assets and bring the money to the church. The apostles would distribute it to those that had needs. And that's how these needs were met. It's a beautiful picture of, of spiritual family and community. And, and I think God desires that we replicate this spirit of community even in our church today. And I think we find ourselves in, in an important time when we have an opportunity to do this very thing. Today, we don't so much face persecution, but we do face a significant pandemic a pandemic that is wreaking havoc on our economy, a pandemic that has caused even many of our church members to, to, to receive pay cuts and furloughs, and many, no doubt, will, will lose their jobs. And there will be needs in this church. And yet there are others in our church who, who still have a job and, and are still making good money and have a surplus. And, and I believe what God would call us to do would be say, say hey, let's, let's regard each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Let's treat each other as family so that those that have needs can be, those needs can be met by those that have surplus. And, and like the early church, um, we have a benevolence fund here at Cornerstone. And, and, and monies that are given to that benevolence fund don't go to the operations of the church. They go strictly to meet the needs of, of needy fellow believers in our church, members of, of our church that are, that are suffering experiences, experiencing loss and hardship right now. And we'll, we'll disperse those monies responsibly and wisely, but it is a privilege, isn't it? to meet the needs of, of our needy members in the body of Christ. And that's what God calls us to do, to respond with the spirit of community and family together. You know, these principles are vital during seasons like the one in which we find ourselves right now. Facing this pandemic, which is robbing people of their lives and their livelihoods. But whether our faith is under fire from a pandemic or, or persecution or anything else that may come our way, as God's people, we must respond with, with compassion, with clarity, with confidence, and a sense of community knowing that it is in these dark times that God is able to do his best work in us and through us. Here's a geologist named Dr. James Clark who recounts visiting the Soviet Union a few years after communism collapsed. He was asked to preach at a small Russian Baptist church that had lived through a long season of persecution. Some in the congregation had been in prison because of their testimony for Jesus Christ. Others had husbands or relatives that had suffered or even been killed for their faith. And Dr. Clark was at first at, at a bit of a loss to know how he could encourage these, these, these precious believers. But he decided to draw on his, his background as a geologist, and he shared with them this illustration. He said this, Clay is actually composed of many microscopic clay mineral crystals, which not even a light microscope can see. But under pressure, the clay minerals are not crushed or made smaller. Rather, they grow larger. The minerals change into new, larger biotype grains forming slate found in many homes. With even more pressure, the minerals become even larger, and some are transformed into garnets, which are semi-precious gems. And Clark went on, he said this, I explained to the congregation that this geological process illustrates how pressure and suffering can be used to refine, purify, and mold a person into a more beautiful soul. He says, I will never forget, forget what I saw when I looked at the congregation it seemed like the whole congregation was sparkling. The babushkas, the old women's eyes, were gleaming, bright with tears, recalling past suffering. He said, what makes a gem so attractive? It's the reflection. And these dear women and men were reflecting God's glory through the suffering they had endured. But uh, the metamorphic rock story didn't end there. He went on. He said, with even more pressure applied, a new mineral forms called storolite. The name is from two Greek words meaning stone cross. The twin variety forms deep under high mountains in the shape of a cross, a reminder of Christ's ultimate suffering for us all. And it is in these seasons of hardship that, that God often does his best work in us, transforming us from clay into precious gems, from sinful fleshly creatures into the very image of Jesus Christ himself. And it is in these seasons when God not only does his best work in us, but he does his best work through us. As we saw in this passage, it is often in the face of opposition that we enjoy the best opportunities to shine brightly for Jesus Christ. So in the days ahead, whether we face pandemics or persecution, may we together as a community respond with compassion and clarity and confidence.